Good morning, afternoon, evening, and night, <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, nice to see all of you from all over the place. As you know from our style, we, we combine the complementary practices of the Brahma Viharas and insight meditation in myriad ways we present them. Sometimes we immediately teach them side by side and giving you a Brahma Vihara of the four Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity. Every few days introducing another Brahma Vihara during a, a straight insight Vipassana meditation retreat. Sometimes we teach like a, an exclusive Brahma Vihara retreat. Uh, with, with some degree of mindfulness and insight in order to keep the Brahma Viharas uh, clearly under the umbrella of wisdom, of insight. Uh, so it's, it's a selfless love, metta infused with, with it, wisdom, compassion, founded, rooted in wisdom, joy, uh, instead of the attached kind of joy, the wisdom makes it this pure, deep, organic upwelling of delight and joy right out of our goodness and fills the body, fills the heart with joy. Uh, and then with the equanimity so that it doesn't just become a, um, a, a way of stepping out of the wisdom process, um, we infuse the wisdom with the Brahma Vihara equanimity. So it's understood that it's, it's, a, it's a subtle quality of seeing beings and, and places that we might otherwise be attached to um, with this very balanced uh, mental equipoise sustained by the wisdom of understanding that the phenomena that we're being balanced with, people, places, and so forth, is subject to the very liberating phenomena we notice in insight practice, the impermanent nature of people and places, their dukkha nature, unreliability due to change. And the, the ultimately uncontrollability of ourselves, all, in our own experience, other people, other beings, and um, the physical environment, we can't control it. That understanding is liberating because we stop trying to control it. We see that the very effort to control it is that self edification, self-building, uh, and that the selfless nature that's realized is vastly freeing. In fact, the very reason why we have the percep perception of abandonment and dispassion is because of the weariness and the weight of the constant energy required to build and sustain this identification 
the self-identification, the attachment that accompanies it, the fear of, of losing even little moments of security as false as they are, as fictitious as they are. Um, so that's why we combine the two. We, we, we need the Brahma Viharas to create space in the body, to create um, this capacious container in, in the heart uh, so that we can do the, the intricate work of seeing where it is we create this sense of ourselves and all its attachments, all its traumas, all, all its ancient emotion, the minefield of emotions that can arise there. Uh, and the Brahma Viharas start to create uh, an externally safe environment. And then we internalize that and we're able to work with the stuff there, um, mostly unprompted. We encourage, we encourage the practice process to be with things as they arise naturally, rather than having an agenda, rather than having a, um, a, a prompted type of practice where we decide we're gonna work on this issue or, or, or this childhood experience or trauma. Paradoxically and beautifully, just what we're capable of seeing and, and opening to and releasing seems to arise by itself with unprompted practice. And at certain times, um, a prompted style is required. And usually it's guided uh, by a teacher who, who sees the value of doing something prompted. Like for example, when we make a, a resolve, which I'll, I'll mention this afternoon, when we, when we resolve to attune to certain perceptions. So I'll start talking about soon. First, I, I would like us all to drop into the body, the whole body or the solar plexus part of the body and, and call up one of the Brahma Viharas, the one that feels most accessible to you right now, metta, that you feel in the body or you focus around the solar plexus, just anchor there. Uh, and in the original teaching style of the Buddha, we simply, and this is a form of prompted meditation, we, we call up the metta element may metta arise or I incline my heart to metta. And then the sense of resting, abiding in the metta field that's there. It's never perfect. And sometimes the metta field seems like a mind field of aversion or anger. It doesn't matter. The, the practice style is then to, to notice that with a metta awareness so that we're actually feeling a metta uh, for the difficult emotions that arise often when we first initially try to practice the metta and all we feel is frustration or, or fear, irritability, the, 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 the opposites of friendliness, kindness. So it doesn't matter what arises. It's really helpful to stay with the physicality, to, to feel the sensation, whatever it is, numb or hard or dense, compacted. It's usually not so helpful to continuously call up the metta you know, once or twice and then 
just real, really make space, relax, have a feeling for abiding in that meta field, regardless of what arises, of what comes as we call it up. If it is difficult, it's often the compassion that's the best response to the difficult states that are there. If, if we're tentative, if we're worried it's not gonna happen, uh, if we feel that we're sort of being driven to make something happen, if we feel expectation, those difficult or frustrating or hesitant emotional states are responded to well with compassion. Any kind of difficulty, the care of compassion is the enlarged awareness that holds it. It's aware of the irritability, aware of the sense of struggle or stressing and just helps relax, makes a relaxing open space around that. It may be that the murita, the elevating nature, uplifting nature of joy is what comes to you naturally and to abide in the body where you feel that joy. So say if it, it, it is in the solar plexus area or in the belly, that you, you feel the physical sensations and the, and the emotion of that joy. And if you're, if you're fairly well practiced and in all of the Brahma Viharas, you, you might feel them coming up at different times like a musical symphony. So then there's no need to prompt, just call up the Brahma Viharas and see what's there. Often it's just exactly what we need to make the body feel itself like a safe container, that we're comfortable in the body. And thus through the body and the sensations and different areas of the body, are safe enough to feel the array of emotions that come up and are felt through the body, through the correlating sensations that are always accompany emotions when they arise. Even if at first it's hard or difficult or we can't find anything in the body, even then if we just choose to anchor around the heart center, solar plexus, or put our hand there, or put our hand in the belly. So there's that, that touch of contact that is itself a meta gesture. The warmth, the contact, the textures, that's, that's meta or care of compassion. Or it helps hold the uplifting delight of joy without becoming attached. So when we practice any of the Brahma Viharas, the accompanying wisdom awareness begins, begins to see how the Brahma Viharas indeed start to, it's as if it frees up space in the body, areas that haven't been felt for a long time, or even they continue, continue to feel numb. 
But the Brahma Vihara, as well as the accompanying wisdom awareness, isn't reactive. The Brahma Vihara just encompasses that numb area or that tender area that hasn't been felt for a long time. And or the wisdom awareness is simply aware of it without any need to change anything. Mindful wisdom awareness doesn't want anything, isn't after anything, doesn't have a goal or objective. It's simply this feeling, sensing awareness from within the body, the sensation, the emotion, the area that's just become available after being shut down, after being locked away. The areas that begin to seem connected with each other instead of disparate parts of the body. It all seems interconnected. One of the perceptions that we can practice is the perception of abandoning. Uh, with Michelle's opening last night, uh, she mentioned um, that part of the sutta that illustrates illustrates the entanglements that create that sense of of me, I or mindness. I like that term, mindness. And as we become more aware of the conditions that, that um, create that strong identification and even the pain, the dukkha of mindness, what it takes to hold it together, the weight, the weariness, that this sense of abandoning arises as a natural, as a natural dharma emotion, that why hold on to that which is weighty and weary in the heart and the mind? So, the abandoning, abandoning insight or disenchantment sometimes we we talk about and dispassion happens by nature but sometimes we can we encourage it by cultivating a perception of it particularly when it's happening on its own when there just seems to be this process of abandoning that is no longer the being fixated on, attached to, are contributing to all those eye-making activities, the thought formations that go into mindness. So the perception of abandoning, the perception of dispassion. Dispassion is when we realize that that underfoot has been this nearly constant craving, wanting. Even far, far underlying all that, that force of craving and wanting is the desire for happiness, the desire for connection, love, liberation. It's just going in the wrong way, thinking, that we have to do something or the wrong view that uh, is that in this awakening process that a self is involved and as long as there's a self in, involved that i the i making continues and 
there's no space for the Dhamma to let go into that abandoning and the perception of, of abandoning and into the dispassion from the passion of clinging and attaching to all the activities that create this separate sense for solid continuing self. So we're, we're, we're moving and feeling these Brahma Viharas in the body, their effect on the body, how you feel the goodness of goodwill and well-wishing, metta, how you feel the emotion of care in the body, caring for the body just as it is, how you feel and experience the uplifting emotion of delight, of joy, and how you feel the, the steadying emotion of equanimity. In a retreat where we combine the two practices, after we do say some days or weeks of the Brahma Vihara practice, we start to switch to the Vipassana by observing what's happening. When we switch to insight awareness, what's happening to the previous metta states of consciousness, compassion consciousness, empathetic joy consciousness, and so forth. We observe their nature. We observe that they too are impermanent. And perhaps at this time, um, in the observing process has been, has been um, nurtured by the Brahma Vihara elements, nurtured by the affectionate nature of, of metta, the caring nature, of compassion. So that when we, which then fosters the little insights that lead to the larger insights that the perception of abandonment, the perception of dispassion and the perception of cessation of the processes altogether are, 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 them, are liberating, not difficult. We're not abandoning something that we actually want to keep. The abandoning process happens when we see that there's nothing worth keeping because it's tied in with the, the mindness of the eye-making process, attachment, clinging, craving, and the dispassion from the habit of seeking sense delight, seeking happiness through the senses, dependent on the senses being pleasant, which cannot be sustained because all the senses and their objects are impermanent. And here's where the perception of abandonment and the perception of dispassion, letting go our passionate clinging to sense pleasures and the perception of cessation, which is a profound level of subtle seeing that Phenomena is disappearing so quickly that all of our insights are to some degree attuning to disappearing phenomena, dissolving phenomena in the body and mind. That is a perception of cessation. And these three perceptions align perfectly with three other perceptions, 
the perception of impermanence and the perception of dukkha and the perception of anatta, not self, uncontrollability, selflessness. So the perception of impermanence corresponds with the perception of abandoning because it's an insight into the continuous transient changing nature that attunes us to process. And anytime we're attuned to process, even for a micro moment, you know, and our practice is, is incremental. So when we do the metta meditation through the body, for example, it can take as long as we want. In fact, it's good to take a long time. And, and then through seeing up close, amplified, how swiftly the body-mind stream is changing. It's a powerful sort of staggering moment of insight that, that feels like a tectonic shift. It's not impermanence like we know the leaf falls off the tree. It's impermanence to the degree that we see that the, the ground, the roots, the tree, the leaf, the air, everything around it is pulsating with this changing nature, continually transforming transient, disappearing, and, and thus that same perception of impermanence aligns with abandoning insight. And the perception of, of the dukkha nature immediately evokes an insight into dissatisfaction. Why hold on to that which is changing? So the dukkha understanding arises actually from seeing impermanence on a more subtle level, deeper nature level. And the perception of the ending of phenomena, which at times with the right concentration, the right external internal security and protection, everything is ceasing moment to moment. And that's a moment that we may have the perception of anatta, perception of the selfless nature of things that if phenomena is unsatisfactory, if everything has this dukkha nature to it, then there's, no, there's nothing within all the phenomenal and psychological world that is really fit to be called a self. Certainly not in, in the ancient Indian definition of a self being happy, being secure. And there's no, no such phenomena that provides that security, that sustainability, that continuity of physical phenomena, mental phenomena being permanent and secure and thus fit to be called a self. Therefore, the perception of, of selflessness, of anatta, uncontrollability of all phenomena is a, is a profound release a profound a way of creating even more space. 
I have a really dear friend from, from university who was doing a retreat not so long ago, self-retreat. And actually for the first time in 50 years that while meditating, he revisited his experience 50 years ago as a psychologist at a military hospital in Vietnam. And it was while he was in this retreat, he heard he was kind of in a deep, concentrated state, very still, internal stillness, external sense of safety and security. That some sounds arose and there was just an association with this metallic whirling sound. And, and so he had the, the memory and vision then of helicopters uh, and, um, and missiles. The first time he was bombed at the hospital, first time there was an attack on the hospital. And he had, except as like a very distant memory, he had forgotten, he had forgotten that. Certainly the feeling felt sense of it. And it all came rushing back and the trauma of shaking uh, fear and terror of, of, of the bombs following, falling all around, the overwhelming sound and, and the, the abject fear and trepidation, the terror that he had. But it, in this moment in retreat, the, there, was, there was the kindness and the care and the, and the openness enough that he could re-experience that from the present time security and stability that he had. And it was the first time in which that, that memory became real, became vivid and visceral, you know, where his body again re-experienced that, but didn't go into that freeze terror that he had been carrying for 50 years. It was a profound letting go, a profound opening and release. You know, and as he told me that, it reminded, it reminded me of a retreat that I was on 20 years after um, losing my, my best friend from high school passed away and I didn't know what to do at such a young age, you know, just a teenager or just coming out of the teenage years. So I locked it away. I, I put it in the hurt locker and, and shut it. And it's like, it's, it's not like I never th thought of my friend, Peter. Uh, I thought of him a lot because I had never felt such closeness and I never had such a deep love for a friend in my entire life. So I would think of him a lot, but I couldn't feel the grief at the time. So 20 years later, I'm 40 years old and we're doing this retreat with Upandita and that's a Brahma Vihara. The first month or two is the Brahma Viharas. And I was quite focused on joy, I think, murita. And so concentrated, there were very few at times, zero thoughts. But suddenly the image came up, as can happen. Fleeting image was stimulated of my friend, Peter. And I saw him um, where I met him in a, at, the, at Sandy Beach, body surfing big waves, not so far from where I am. And, and then I quickly shut that down, returned to the Mudita meditation. 
which was so powerful and secure and so utterly pleasant and delightful. Um, but that momentary micro moment image of Peter, it, it left a fragrance, it left a, a mark. And there's just a moment there where I, I, I knew I was gonna make a decision whether to keep that at bay and to stay focused on my meditation or come out of the meditation process and observe what happened if I let in all, all that would come with the image and memory of my friend, Peter. So I chose the latter. I chose to come out of the meditation, deep meditation on, on empathetic joy and let Peter in and, and thus for the first time in 20 years, did I miss him? Did I feel loss? Was I able to grieve what I could not grieve 20 years early? Was I able to open that hurt locker and let out all the love and all the joy and all the goodness of that profound friendship? A friendship that, that changed my life for that first 20 years and brought things to my life that I, I had never had or I had forgotten. And even though Peter was gone, he left such a, a massive imprint in my heart, such a profound love uh, that I had, had blocked with the grief, was shutting away the grief. And now all of a sudden it was available. And I just, I wept for hours. I just let the weeping and the tears and the grieving process happen in that protected shelter of the retreat and the Brahma Viharas that I had been doing um, exclusively. Now it became the shelter for feeling the grief. So I, I was, I was thinking about, I was thinking about my friend in on Vancouver Island, who for fifty years had this terror locked away, and 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 along with it, um, that part of his life, that part of his life that was. disabled from that huge traumatic violent bombing and, and attack and and his work of trying to repair broken psyches broken hearts of the veteran of the of the soldiers there um, he'd only been able to reach it kind of at a distance uh, sick successful to a degree, you know, where he could write about it, but, but also painful because he couldn't feel it. And now he was able to feel it without being distressed, as if he had a perception of not holding on to all the energy it took to, to lock it away and suppress it and, and to be with it dispassionately, you know, the, the opposite of, attachment is aversion and, and just, they're the same, two sides of the same craving, craving to have, craving, craving to get rid of. So, so he's able to, again, have a felt sense of that terror, but from a very secure and grounded way. So the abandoning and the dispassion and the cessation seeing that that wasn't permanent, that those fear moments and trauma were themselves impermanent. And they all, and they aligned with the perceptions of impermanence and uh, the dukkha nature 
because what's impermanent isn't reliable, doesn't give us the security, doesn't give us the happiness that we want. And if it's all dukkha, then, then where is there a separate solid, continuous I, me, or mindness? Instead, it's that open, liberating spaciousness of the insight into selflessness, uncontrollability of phenomena. And likewise, the association I had with locking away the grief and loss from my friend Peter passing away at a young and tender age, and then taking 20 years and a deep retreat to have a moment where I could, I could do a prompted intentional opening to that loss and, and feel that loss and feel the, the liberation that comes from feeling the loss and side by side of it, the return of all the love and, and of all the worthiness I always felt around Peter. We, we never had a harsh word between us ever. In, in 12 years of deep friendship from middle school through his college years, it was just, just an unbelievable love and friendship. And they get all of that back. The price was grieving and, and going through and feeling the grief under the, under the canopy of the Brahma Viharas, compassion, kindness, equanimity. And under the canopy of insight awareness, to have those perceptions of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness. Well, I just will end with What, what we do to facilitate these perceptions and, and these processes, you know, to allow for the degree of safety that comes. And, and the four kind of, you can call them the four containers that help are the realization, understanding of seclusion. Michelle mentioned yesterday the qualities of rest and solitude. They are both definitions of the, the Pali term we wake up, which means seclusion, solitude. It also means rest, relaxation. That is not the ordinary rest uh, when we're tired after a long day or after exercise. Profound, call it Dhamma rest, Dhamma relaxation. Like if you can just imagine the really deepest kind of release of letting go, when, when we have the perception of cessation, we have that sense of release, of letting go. Unlike anything we can do by a decision and it beyond the intention to let go. It just, it just comes from the verve of our Vipassana practice, the insight that's a condition of letting go from seeing that cessation. So that's the we wake up. That's our, it's our external, internal security. Externally, in your house, ideally, it, it's safe. It's safe enough. It's no um, disturbing noises and interruptions and so forth. And if we have a safe external environment, uh, we wake up 
external environment, we can internalize that. And the internal we wake up is being safe from constant harassment from the hindrances, sense desires, distraction, and so forth. So the solitude, the seclusion of we wake up is the first container and condition for these powerful alignments, perceptions of um, abandoning and dispassion, cessation, corresponding to perceptions of impermanence, dukkha and anatta, selflessness. And the second, as Michelle mentioned yesterday was the uh, samadhi. Samadhi also is a, a, more, a subtler container, subtler than the seclusion because it's, as the mind feels safe, as the heart feels safe, externally, internally, it gets more still. And that's samadhi. Samadhi is the utter stillness, utter quiet, quietude, delicate, so that we can actually attune to dispassion, see the profundity and liberation, release of dispassion. And the third is, as we, as, as we grow our insight practice and grow the Brahma Viharas, making more space in the body between every cell, every, all the ligaments and bones, we literally feel an internal spaciousness. And we start to feel a kind of, spiritual well-being and ease. The sense of kind of leaning back on time and letting things unfold on their own. That's when we start attuning to the impermanent, anicca nature of things. And it brings about a kind of happiness, just a seclusion and that, that protection is a form of happiness and the samadhi the happiness of just not being distracted continuously from the myriad things and coming together like many small streams into a still pond. So too, this, this third container where we start uh, having a, a profound anicca and naroda experience. We're seeing the impermanence and the cessation of things. And so there's very deep level release or let go. And that brings up this sweet happiness. The Buddha called it uh, the sweetest happiness in samsara, the sukha, deep sense of ease and well being. So it's more profound than the more ecstatic. Um, the sort of peaking and cresting kinds of joy. This is a settled, deep kind of happiness where we feel we can sit for a long time, even with discomfort. That's a container. And the last one is a combination of letting go and equanimity. The utter letting go is the same as the stability, anchoredness, integration of equanimity, the, the unperturbedness that's the opposite of mindness. That's the doc for today. May you benefit from it and may you uh, May you delight in the perceptions of abandoning and dispassion, cessation. I can't hear the bell when you're ringing it.
Does everyone hear the bell? Good. <laughs> so please continue with your practice now. If you're going to walk, remember, you know, from some of the questions I heard this morning, if walking slow uh, affects things like a, a low back pain, don't walk slow or lean against something. Lean against the wall or um, the back of a sofa or a chair. <laughs> walk faster, walk at the speed where there's no aggravation of the, of the lower back pain or whatever ailment you might have. I mean, that should be a rule for, for all of you experienced yogis. Walk at the speed that seems the most supportive to continuity of mindfulness continuous mindful presence, whatever speed that is, and it might change all the time. Or even I find it really helpful with, with my physical ailments and conditions. I, I like to stand, I do a lot more standing now. And I do incremental micro movements either forward or side to side, it's incremental movement. So there, there is movement and the speed doesn't matter. For me at the time, whatever I'm feeling at the moment, in my body, sometimes it's, it's, it's that barely moving at all or just micro moving that's most helpful. But other times I can do quite brisk walking and I just find that helpful. So experiment in that, in that regard, but do experiment. That is, I, we encourage you to walk. It's a critical part of the practice and brings the quality of energy different than the energy we generate from sitting upright keeping our spine in alignment and our body relaxed. The energy cultivated from movement is unique. And also the concentration that comes from meditation in motion is unique, different than the concentration from being still, from just sitting or standing. So like a, a fluid samadhi that, that converges, unifies with the energy. And it brings something overall to the practice that we would not otherwise get. So the four postures that the Buddha mentioned are all unique and all conducive to something different in the practice. What the, what the sitting, and the effort to maintain the sitting posture brings is different than the standing posture. You know, and sometimes there, there were sayadas I met in Burma years ago who could stand for hours and hours mindfully. And others that I met where walking was the main thing that the sayadah did for his liberation. So everyone at that monastery did tons of walking and would just sit the rest of it between walking. So I'm just suggesting that um, all four are important. Ideally, they're all balanced, but sometimes we need more of one than the other. And you'll find us encouraging you to do that. Thank you. Don't forget we have our um, thank you, Stephen, and thank thanks everybody uh, for your practice. And we have a meta chant uh, in half an hour, right? Yeah. Okay. In half an hour we have the meta chant. So have a good walk or whatever. <laughs>